All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Samantha Mirabal with Melco's application team, and Happy New Year. Um, these are our design shop talks. We tend to, we try to hold them weekly to see what questions you might have. I know next week I actually have a conflict, so unless I can figure out how to do it at the hotel, we might have to skip next week, but unless someone else wants to do it. Anyhow, um, regardless, look, I have a list of questions that were sent in ahead of time. If you have questions while we're live, both on Facebook and YouTube, just type them in in the chats and um, I will try to get them answered while we're live. Don't send them privately. I will not see those. All right, until someone sends them to me at a later point. <laughs> I don't have access to the PMs. All right, check both systems. It looks like YouTube and Facebook are both live. And there's my chats. Good morning, Michelle. Thanks for joining. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into them. How do I import different fonts? So it really depends on what type of font we're talking about here. Um, I did get you some links to some articles. And um, let's see if I can, nope. So I'll show you how to find them. Melco. So if you go to the melco-servicesite.com and click on this FAQ, and then up here, A-L-P-H-A-B-E-T, alphabets. So the two things I have here, the links I gave you, adding and editing alphabets in Design Shop, and then alphabets in Design Shop and Overview, both of these will take you to articles. Like if you search by those, they'll pop up um, on the different types of alphabets and how to get them. We got you a link to the article. Yay, I, didn't, I wasn't sure if anyone was gonna be joining me today. Thank you. All right, so we've got a link to these and it will talk about the different type of alphabets we have. So OFAs are the native, are native um, fonts to design shops. So that's the ones that are keyboard typable in there that are already digitized specific for embroidery. So that's the ones where you come over here, all of these you know, embroidered fonts are all what are known as OFAs, okay? So those are alphabets specific for embroidery with, for design shop. The other ones that you would have, um, early alphabets, those are the ones that don't look like stars. And then if you buy files from online, so let's say you go and buy a font that's, um, and when you open it up, you've got a hundred different files, right? You've got an A dot EXP, a B dot EXP, a capital A dot EXP. You've got all the different things in different sizes. Those you put in one at a time, they're not typable. So those are just embroidery files that you're gonna have to open up one at a time, paste them into a file and turn them into something. In other words, they're not actually alphabets. They're just a bunch of individual files that you have to merge together. And then there's the computer fonts. Um, TTF, um, true type fonts, OTF, open type fonts, I believe. Um, those are ones that you install into Windows and then Design Shop pulls, um, opens them up for you, right? So down here under true type, all of these are computer fonts that are installed on my computer that I can then use to create lettering, right? Okay, so the, for those, you would download your o, OTF or TTF file, install it into Windows, make sure Design Shop's closed. Next time you open it, it will pull from the computer fonts and it'll be in this list somewhere. Okay, so that's, we've got you a link to um, adding the alphabets using the alphabet editor. If you want to create your own fonts, that's cool. Um, and then there's kind of those different ways to go about it. Oops, let's see. Um, when are they going to fix the blur outline feature? I don't know. I don't have any insight into the timelines. I know it is a reported bug um, and I think it's fixed in the next update, but I haven't tested it. I have the next update. I'll look at that later um, to see, but um, I don't have insight into when they release things, so or even specific bugs when they're going to be incorporated or not. Um, so I don't know. I wish I did, but I don't. All right. Uh, how to import different fonts? We covered that. How, demonstration on how to bring a picture in Design Shop and turn it into an embroidered product. So we've got a whole bunch of videos that we've done in the past um, on that do exactly that, and you'll see why I'm not 
doing that right now. Like uh, this one is 30 minutes. Uh, where's the other one? The cool one. I thought that was it. That's not it. Is that it? Oh, I linked them twice. I'm sorry. So there was, there's a, so this one's good. That one is 17 minutes. And then there's another one here. There's another one that is digitized with us or something like that. Um, it's got a uh, morning glory as the design and it's great. I, it's about an hour and 12 minute video and they do exactly that. They open up the, um, the art, bring it in. So I'll show you some of it, but to digitize something start to finish is kind of a few, you know, can it be a long process, but what you would do is first go get your artwork, right? So, um, if I go to the C drive designs, there's this graphics folder. I'm going to open up this earth day just cause it's there. All right, so that opens up artwork. The very first step you always want to do when you digitize is size your art to the size you want the final product to be. So what you don't want to do is digitize something that's you know 20 inches wide when you intend to sew it as a three inch pocket because you're going to do make different design decisions. You'll use satin stitches instead of fill stitches if it's smaller. You'll use running stitches instead of satin stitches if it gets super small. So it, you're going to choose different type of elements based on the size, right? So bring in your artwork, select it, and then scale it down to the size you want. So if this is a three inch round um, left chest, I would scale it down to three inches. And now I can go about digitizing. When you're digitizing, it's really, I always think of them as a puzzle of working from back to front so you work from your background forward finishing as you go if you can so if you have things that have a bunch of different outlines you want to kind of piece it together and do those outlines as you're going um, as it makes sense as you're coming forward so you know it's this i would do the sky and then i can do the waves the mountains do the trees and i would probably wait on the sun do the outlines and then the sun but it really doesn't matter so you would basically work your way forward thinking about the different elements that you're going to use. You know, can you do this, these waves? Can I do that as a solid fill? Well, yeah, I could. So just as an example, I could come in here knowing the black is going to come over and do the separation. I could come over and do the water all in one thing and then do the satin stitches of the waves over top. Or I could come in and do these as separate sections, right? where each section has a different stitch direction. Why would I, why would that matter? Well, this is where it comes down to personal preference, right? So each of us are, oops, that was bad. Let's try that again, back up. All right, so each of us are gonna have a different interpretation of what we think looks nice. And we can play with the stitch directions to almost make it look like there's motion in there, right? So the light hits thread different based on the angle it's facing. So you can actually play with those sorts of things and even the stitch directions to give it a more dynamic, interesting look. So you can see compared to my flat, just this by changing my stitch directions, one's going this way, the other's going that way, it gives it a little more life. So you can do that. and. Is there anything wrong with this? No. Um, it's the same thing if I've got a monochrome. Let, um, I don't think I have the file on this computer, but there's a, th I saw once someone digitized a train, right? It was all black. It was a solid color train, all done in black. And you could do that as a flat fill. And it would um, block, block it all. It would cover it up. It would look like a train. But if you took a little bit of time and actually digitize the wheel, digitize the spokes, digitize the connecting link between it, the smokestack, and then all the different elements of it. Oh my gosh, the look, the difference of it is really impressive versus just a flat fill. So those are just things that you have to decide for yourself of how you want to do it. Okay. Um, but we've got a bunch of videos out there that you can check out on how to um, bring it in. But basically you bring your artwork in and then just start building it using your basic tools. Okay. Um, where can we buy OFA fonts? Um, I do not know. I don't use them. I digitize I either digitize them myself or um, use the ones built into Design Shop. Um, I know there are a bunch of digitizers that do OFA. I don't know 
who specializes in OFA fonts per se. Um, but you know, it's, I'm not sure you would have to contact the different digitizers and find out if they're comfortable doing, um, building OFA fonts for you through the alphabet editor. All right. I just do it myself. So I'm annoyed that this link keeps on bringing you to that video, but if you get that code there, that'll take you to the morning glory one, which is pretty cool. All right, anyway, what's the difference between, between um, Design Shop 10 Plus Pro versus 11? Uh, there's a series of videos that were done a while back um, that actually go through all the different fe um, features. It's actually a playlist on Melko's channel that walks through there. So that might be the best way to look through them. They did a series of little um, videos kind of stepping through the new features to kind of show you the differences. Um, I've been using 11 for so long that I'm not sure I'd remember them all from 10 to 11 because some of them, I like them so much, I just consider them essential now. <laughs> so, but that's what I would suggest is check out that playlist. It, work, it goes through all of that pretty nicely for you. Um, so yeah, if you go on to, st oops, stop. Why did it just do that? Oh, because I hit X rather than click. So if you look here, we don't want to listen to it. There's this whole playlist that goes over all the different features. So it's Design Shop V11 New Features. That's the name of the playlist. So if you go to Melco's channel and click on playlists, it's down there somewhere new features. So it's on that playlist right there. Okay. All right. I moved my Bravo from upstairs to the, from an upstairs room to the basement. Any checks I need to do? Um, plug it in and go. Uh, no, I mean, that's kind of glib, but to some degree, as long as you didn't bang it, you're fine. Um, and when I mean bang it, you didn't knock the head off the machine. You didn't um, drop it, things like that. Then I don't know. I've got 15 out there that I've moved across and all I ever did was plug them in and hit go. Um, if you took the keypad off, put it back on. So things like that, just the obvious, make sure it's hooked up correctly, um, that your wires are running straight, um, that the, you don't have, you didn't tape down a cable. So anything you did while moving, you wanna make sure you don't actually impinge motion. So if you did something like that, you wanna make sure you undo it all. But I don't know. I would plug it in, make sure everything, the, the movement path is clear, oil it and go. Because oiling the hook every day is a good idea anyway. Um, what to do about corners when doing applique on large letters? I've digitized it instead of making the font larger. That's cool. Then use Captain Miters um, for the top stitch. Again, that's cool. One letter will do fine, others won't. When that happened, it duplicated the one that did right, make sure the properties match and still didn't work. So um, with the miters, things to look out for. One is depending on the angle. So for different letters, um, the angle of different points might be different. So that might actually be what's driving it to not do the miter or not do the capped end is that it's just a slightly different angle um, upon there. Other things, if you accidentally end up with um, When you also look at the corners, uh, the points, if you've got an extra point in there or a stitch direction near where the miter or the cap needs to go, that's going to mess it up completely as well. So let's say I have two um, wireframe points right next to one another. It's not going to miter correctly if you have that. So you're going to have to clean up the corners to make sure you don't have duplicate points, that you don't have errant stitch directions um, too close to where it needs to do that because all of that will make it where it won't do it. Um, other than that, it's really based on the angles of the different elements of whether it's going to miter or not. So those are the things I always look for is errant points and then the stitch direction lines being there. Um, if those are, if you've got a stitch direction close to where the miter is going to be, it's not going to do it. It's going to sweep around and you'll be banging your head on the wall for a while until you delete that stitch direction line or move it away from the corner. So those would, and particularly if you do change stitch icon every now and then, it will put stitch direction lines 
every few inch, every few centimeters it seems, they're everywhere. And if one's too close to the corner, that's going to cause you issues. Um, uh, design shop upgrade. I have no insight onto release schedules at all, so I couldn't answer that. Um, I know Melco's always working to improve products, so they're always doing new, new things and working on all sorts of stuff, but I don't have any insight into the timelines. So I don't know. Um, yeah. I know how to, I can digitize, but I don't know timelines. All right, how do I make a border for a patch? So let's see. Hmm. Let's open a design. I don't know. Legacy designs. Oh, no, thank you. I don't know. Let's do that. All right. So let's say I want to put it, I want to turn this into a patch for whatever reason. What can we do to turn it into a patch? Well, I can always draw a circle, right? So draw a circle and align it up. Um, things, if I really wanted to be the, a patch border, I'd want to make that larger, right? And then I also need my placement, tack down, zigzag, and then this thing, right? So I would take this guy, copy, come to the top, paste, and move it up change the element type to a walk. So there's my placement, copy paste to new color. I usually make the second one a bean stitch, personal preference, you don't have to make it bean, um, but a bean stitch, that's cool. So that would, so first I'd lay my fabric down, I'd sew it down with my bean stitch, get my scissors, cut out my circle, and then I would do a tackle stitch next. And the tackle, probably closer to 30. And that's my zigzag that holds that fabric down. And then I'd sew my design, and then the final step would be the border. Okay, so that's if I wanted this to be a circle. Well, what if you want it closer to the shape of your thing? Well, I can go Object, Generate Basting Primer, Primer Stitch. I'm just going to accept whatever the default is. That's cool. And I'm going to delete that. This, I'm going to clean up some of these points that I know won't matter. There we go. That's better. Just deleting some of these extras. All right, so now I've got a fill. All right, so I've got a fill. We don't want it to be a fill. So I'm gonna use my change element from one type to another, change it to a walk normal, and I'm gonna replace it. So there's my placement stitch. Copy, paste, give it a different color, make it a bean stitch, so that'd be color two. Copy, paste, give it a different color, change it to, oops. I gotta change its type, so control, click on that. Now I can change it to a tackle. Yeah, make it a 30. And then I can copy this guy, copy, come to the end, paste, make it a satin stitch, closer to 40. There, so now I got a border. Had I taken a little bit more time to clean up those points, it'd be a little smoother, but there you go. So it's really depending on how you wanna draw what shape you want your patch to be in. Okay. Um, how do you get a good, clean, smooth satin stitch for small lettering five millimeters? What is five millimeters? Oh, you're gonna make me do math. That's what, five millimeters are this points? I always forget. 25.4 points. I'm gonna look like an idiot right now. Sorry, I believe it's points, so five points wide. Is that right? Joanne, you're gonna have to help me out in a unit that I can think on the live. <laughs> ah. Let's see, because I have my, my thing set up for inches. I guess I can go change that. Tools, options, where are the units? Measurement units. Um, hmm. let's change it to millimeters. Okay. Does that make it where I can see it? All right, so five millimeters. <laughs> this is ridiculous, I'm sorry. Okay, 50 points. <laughs> ah, 
points I recognize. All right, 50 points. This, that one should be nice and smooth. So I don't know why you would have it lumpy. Let's see. Because 50 points, I mean, that's a nice wide satin, which is pretty. So let's make it 50. I'm trying to think of things to consider on that. So the wider it gets, sometimes if the stitches are long, you need more of its friends next to it to help hold it up and keep it so that the stitches are touching to keep them kind of supporting one another. So I always think of this, someone else referred to it this way of, you know, it needs its friends next to it. So in those cases, reducing your density a little bit helps, right? So instead of having a four, changing that to, you know, three, five or something like that. Um, oh, you're talking about lettering 50 points high. Well, again, that's not very small, right? Sorry, my reading comprehension has failed. Can you tell I had a really nice vacation? All right, let's do lettering. Micro. So first off, use the right fonts, right? So push-pull, particularly on small fonts, is done um, a little bit different because you've, depending on the size of the font, you're going to end up with, um, you've got to overcompensate in the different directions to get it to look clean. So making sure you use good fonts is a good step. Um, another, you can see all these connector stitches kind of blended all together. That's not helping anything. Um, making sure you have your pull compensation on there is also helpful. Um, I always like to increase my spacing between things when it gets a little bit smaller, just to kind of force it to spread out a little bit more to make it a little more legible. So that's just another trick I like. Um, you Making sure you have a center walk. So you weren't talking about this, you were talking about lettering, so I apologize. <laughs> um, so th things on my small lettering, making sure your densities aren't too dense, right? So if you have a 3.0 density on something small and you're using 40 weight thread, it's like you're gonna sew a ton of stitches in a tiny little area and it makes it look bumpy, right? It's too much in that area. So actually increasing your density to thin it out a little bit actually helps, particularly if you're staying with a thicker weight thread. Now, if you're going down to a 60 weight thread, of course, you're gonna have to lower your densities. It's a thinner thread, so you need more stitches. Um, using a center walk, you gotta make sure you have good underlay. If you use a edge walk or things like that, the columns are often too narrow and that'll actually cause you issues. Making sure your tie-in and tie-offs are set to a um, style one. Um, the big style five is a great lock stitch, um, but it's very visible and it hangs out from under your lettering. So that's another thing is making sure your, your lock stitches, both your tie-in and tie-outs are not, you know, the style five. Um, using a smaller needle, so physically on the machine, using smaller needles, going from a 7511 down to a 70 or 69, um, that's quite helpful. So reducing your needle size. Um, I'm trying to think what other tips we've got. I mean, that's really the biggest ones is to not, not overdo it with the density, right? So making sure you don't end up with, um, these densities here really small because that's just too many stitches into a small area. So you really want to make sure you're staying closer to four, even a little bit higher um, will help and making sure that you have a little bit of pull offset on it because remember it, things shrink. That's really what I would focus on. Um, you know, you can always, the connectors, if they're in the way, you can always come over here and change this to closest points. Um, that will rearrange them all so that the connectors are smaller and a little less visible. At having a whole bunch of trims between each letter, particularly when you're super small, is a, is not a good idea. So um, you want, want to leave those connectors and make them as small as possible whenever you can. Plus, no one really sees them when it's really small anyway. All right, so Joanne, sorry I got distracted of the five millimeter. Hopefully that's a little bit helpful. We did get you a link to small lettering, um, but I mean, the biggest things is paying attention to density, making sure your underlay, and then needle size. Those are kind of the 
and the tie in and tie out. So those are kind of the big, the big ones I focus on personally. Um, when using custom designs, can they be resized? Um, I assume you're talking about these guys down here. Um, custom designs like these things. Yeah, they're all, these are all OFMs. They're all um, wireframes. So yeah, you can resize them. Just drag them to the size you want. So yeah, you can resize those. They're, the only thing time you really need to be careful is when you're dealing with um, things that are expanded. So over here, you don't see wireframes. You see things that say expanded. I'll go open one just to show you. So if I go open this guy, notice these over here all say expanded. Scaling these, you gotta be careful using only plus or minus 10% or so. Um, you can do 20, but I prefer staying closer down to the 10%. Because um, the more you scale these, the more likely you're going to be distorting the intent of the design. So your stitches are going to get too long or too small if you're shrinking it down. But these designs down here, yeah, you can resize them all you want. You know. That one's pretty. Anyway, yeah, you can scale them around. I would not go that small, but anyway. All right, what other questions? Let's see. We talked about the border, we did that. How to tighten stitches for taller, wider designs like a one inch satin compared to a four inch satin. Okay, I this question when I was looking at it ahead of time, I got completely derailed looking at this last sentence. A one inch satin compared to a four inch satin. Satin stitches shouldn't be one inches, except for pretty limited exceptions. I'm thinking puff maybe. Um, when you have stitches that long, they're really uh, prone to snagging, right? So when I'm talking about one inch, four inch, gosh, a four inch piece of thread, I don't think you're ever going to get that to sew nicely. Um, it's just, it doesn't have enough support from its neighbors next to it to help hold it up. Now, if you put puff under it, that helps push up on the thread and that, that might help you. But one of the things you'll notice with puff designs, the longer they get, um, well, it's not even the longer they get. With puff designs, your density is really low. So there's a lot of thread running back and forth and you've got puff underneath pushing up on them, right? So that's what's kind of giving that support for those long threads. Um, satin stitches really shouldn't be over 60 to 70 points long. Because I mean, if you've got, to think of this this way, if I do something with a one inch satin on it as a decorative throw, the minute my puppy jumps off, jumps up and rubs against it, that design is going to be destroyed um, if you try doing that on a left chest pocket. So anything that has any sort of um, wear to it, it's just not a good idea um, to do that. But I mean, if you're going to do really long satins, it's going to be puff designs. You're going to decrease your density and you've got to have that under layer to help push up on the thread to support it all. So between the large amount of thread, so lots of stitches back and forth, and then the push from the puff that's what's going to keep it nice and smooth and of course when you're done you you know pop it with a um, heating a heat gun slightly and that gets all the um, that gets all the things cleaned up all right joanne five millimeter wide not five millimeter wide five millimeter tall yeah that's what i covered i went back wait five meter millimeter tall text yeah so all right Maisha types foam okay let me know what you want to know about foam but yeah for this sort of thing using foam would help push up on the stitches to help hold it uh, the benefits of being able to bring in SVG files SVG files are half the work of digitizing right so if you look at close some of the stuff no yeah. All right. So an SVG file is basically, I'll draw a vector here. Yeah, thank you. Yes, foam. That was the word I was not dealing well with. All right. So right here, we've got um, a vector. So imagine if you have an SVG file 
SVG files or like an EPS file, they're vector formats. They're basically shapes that are math based that have no stitches, no properties assigned to it. So it's a graphic design type thing, right? So I've got this shape that I bring into Design Shop and it can be a bunch of shapes. So if I go open, um, let me go grab an actual design rather than me drawing random stuff. All right. So this is the same thing if I opened it as an SVG, right? So all of these are vector shapes. The only difference between this and a fill stitch is a stitch direction, right? So I can draw a stitch direction across that. And now that is stitches. Same with this. I can come over here and add a few stitch directions and poof, the work is done. I didn't have to trace anything, right? I just selected it updated the stitch type and now I've got a file that or you know I've got a shape so that's really by bringing in vector art that's it's saving you time from having to go around and trace your shapes trace your pictures and do all that work um, I can come over here and pretty quickly create a coffee cup right just by adding some stitch directions to it um, question how was I doing stitch directions cool so if you select your vector shape all right right here you've got these editing tools that's insert a hole insert a splice give it a start or stop that one right there is insert stitch direction so notice my cursor now changes to an arrow with that the box with the line between it that's the visual cue of what I'm in that's the stitch direction um, indicator. So I just left click and drag until I'm happy. Then I hit escape, click on the next tool, click on this guy, and now I just start left clicking and dragging until I like how the stitches are laying. Okay, so you just keep on adding your stitch directions however you want them. Um, in general, the fewer stitch directions you add, the better. And also think about it, if I add, if I tell stitch directions to fight, bad things are going to happen, right? So, oh, well, that's not fighting. Let's see. If I tell the stitches to run this way, and now I immediately try to tell it to go this way on top of each other, um, eventually it's not going to understand what I'm trying to do. So, um, yeah. There we go. So you go and add your um, stitch directions along there. When using custom designs, um, I always get warnings from Design Checker. Do I need to address these with columns listed in 10 points? No tie-ins and tie-offs. So some of these designs are older and they have manually digitized tie-ins and tie-outs. The manually digitized tie-ins and tie-outs don't show up on the checker because it's not a setting, right? So here, if I go into the properties and I turn on these tie-in and tie-offs, it's a setting now applied to those stitches. So if I come over to the design checker, it's not going to give me any issues. But if I had have gone in and used this manual stitch and digitized my own type style five knot, and then went straight from this into something else without having um, a, a tie-in property set, it's going to tell me I didn't have a tie-in stitch. Well, I did. It was just manually done. So some of the older files um, are like that. Now, columns less than 10, I would at least look at it and see what it is. If it's just a tie-off stitch that um, was done manually, okay, it doesn't matter. Um, smaller ones like that. If it really is a tiny little column stitch, then add some pull compensation to get it above the 10. That's different things. So I, you know, when using the design checker, I always look at it as a guide and not a hard set rule. Um, I look at each section and make a decision on if what it told, what it's pointing at, do I think that's a problem or not? So it will show you when you click on the issue, it'll show you where that issue is. You can zoom in on that part of the file and go, oh, that's fine. It's just an extra manual stitch or, hey, that column is a little bit narrow. I need to add a little pull offset so you can update it, add some pull offset and make the column a little bit wider. So, um, I would look at them at a minimum and make that decision of, you know, go through the list and I wouldn't immediately just say, no, I can't sew it. I would look at it and kind of make that judgment call of whether it needs to be fixed or not. All right, let's see. Happy New Year. Thanks for joining. 
All right, what else do we have? All right, so we did stitch directions, but that's really what the benefit of an SVG file or an EPS or pretty much any vector format is gonna be quick digitizing. It saves half the work. There's nothing worse than um, having a, I'll show you, <laughs> going and pulling up a piece of artwork, a bitmap, and imagine it's worse than this. It's even blurrier and less pixelated. And now, rather than just being able to click and add a stitch direction, no, I gotta go through here, and I have to trace stuff, right? So now I'm eyeballing it, and it just takes more time versus me adding a stitch direction or adding a set of splice lines or things like that. So working with SVG files is a big time saver. Um, you know, because there, I digitize that part kind of. Well, if I convert that to vector, so if that were given to me as a vector, rather than doing all that tracing, all I'd have to do is apply a stitch direction, maybe add some holes, things like that. Can you give an explanation of push and pull? Absolutely, my favorite. I, I like pull compensation. All right, so triangles are a really easy way to demonstrate. So if I draw a triangle, I give it a start, a stop, and a stitch direction. All right, so I got a triangle here, right? So when your machine is sewing, well, let's look at a column first. All right, so if I go look at this guy, I'm only doing this because so, it's easy to look at. So from what I'm gonna, my machine, it's gonna go make a stitch here. What does it do? It jams the needle through my fabric, it connects with the bobbin, and now my top thread's coming up, and what's happening to my machine now? I'm going at a high speed this way. So the, fa the thread is being pulled through that hole, and now my machine's moving this way, so that thread's pulling. So what's, that, what's happening? This hole is trying to move this way. All right, well now I, so just imagine this hole is now shifted. Now I come over here, I stab the fabric, grab my bobbin, and now I move in at a high speed this way. So what's happening to the hole I just made in my fabric? It's coming this way. So this entire line of stitches is moving in. This one's moving in. All right, so that's pull. It's narrowing up. Um, then what's happening in the other direction? So as I narrow things, my fabric is trying to push out, right? So that's kind of what push-pull is doing. You're dealing with the just nature of embroidery of how it physically has to happen, things are gonna narrow up roughly anywhere up to as high as 10%, let's say. All right, so you always know that if you tell it to sew 50 points wide, it might actually sew 49 points wide because it's narrowing up. So you wanna add some compensation so that it actually sews the size you want it to. All right, so if you look at this guy and I go to properties and go to compensation, there's pull by percent, which is, um, multiplication base. So it looks at the distance from one side of an element to the other and whatever percent you tell it, that's how much it's going to overstitch by. So this is why I don't like the um, pull by percent because my triangle doesn't look like a triangle anymore. It looks like a spaceship, right? Because it's multiplication base as I get from this point to there. That's my longest point of the triangle based on the stitch direction. So it's going to overstitch more versus in this corner it's hardly um, compensating at all because it's just a very small area. So it adds distortions to it. If I change that back to 100 now, and I'm gonna put a big number, don't use this, but um, so just to be silly, if I make that 10, now I'm overstitching by 10 points, or 12 points in this case, so that it's just making it more bold, making it wider, so it's compensating for the fact that it's gonna narrow up, okay? so. What should you be using? I don't know. Um, I put one to two points on everything I do, period, of offset, pull offset. I don't personally use pull compensation by percent. Um, I don't like it, but that's 100% uh, that's me. That, so if you love it, go for it. Um, it's just, I don't like that sometimes it'll distort things. So the only way I avoid, I know I'm avoiding that for, by, for sure, is to use offset. So again, that's a personal preference, 100%. So if 100% if percent is your game, go for it. Um, but yeah, that's what compensation is doing. So it's overstitching so that when it shrinks, it gives you what you're actually looking for. All right. Um, difference in, no problem. All right, difference in micro and normal chenille. Um, 
I don't know. So chenille is done with a specific machine that is not an embroidery machine. So there's chenille machines that make those like letterman patches and they're loops, right? So it's a gazillion little loops in a shape and they cut it out on felt and hey, you got your nice little letterman shape. Um, it's a completely different process. When we do it on an embroidery machine, we do a kind of a faux chenille look, which is a setting on our software that we basically digitize specifically and then we set up our machine to sew with these heavier threads that kind of make loops on the top, right? So there's an entire section on, um, we've got a help article as well as some videos on digitizing for micro chenille. There's the STL files and all the other things that are in that help file that you can download and use to create your own. Now, just to complicate this scenario, um, <laughs> Not only do you have micro chenille, which is kind of using a thicker thread to get these kind of faux loops on the top to make it appear to have that texture. Um, and then you've got folks that are now doing a faux chenille, which is with a polyester thread, right? And they're, for lack of a better way, is they're scribbling all over the fabric. So they're based doing a fill stitch with inconsistent stitch directions. Um, so it literally looks like the machine's scribble scrabbling around and while it's doing a fill stitch. And that's so the light hits it different and it makes it look like a, a chenille because of how the light's hitting it when it's not really a chenille stitch. So there's like three different ways people are currently doing it. Either a true chenille, the micro chenille, which is kind of force it, you set up your machine and your files um, to kind of give this bumpy texture on the top. You use a bermelon or an acrylic thread, which is much thicker and that gives the look. Um, in the, the help article, we've got some sample files that you can look through, but there's very specific things with a cross pattern through there to force the issue with the, um, that look that are specific to setting up the files correctly. So take a look at that. But, and then there's the complete new thing that's going around, which is a form of scribble scrabble. And I did a, I did that as a decorative, um, last year. Hey, which is a few days ago, anyway, um, of how to set up a decorative to create your own faux chenille. So that's in the past design shop talks. All right, what other questions? Let me quick look and see if I skipped any. Talked about that, I did that, cool. Okay. Yeah, I think I covered it all. Any other questions before we call it a day? I know there's a trade show coming, coming up, um, ISS Long Beach. Uh, is there any way to group color, hang on, new to Milko, is there a way to group colors when stitching out a design? What do you mean by that, group colors when stitching out a design? I don't understand that question. When you, you can group colors all you want in design shop, right? So, I mean, I can come over, oh, excuse me. Let me draw something else. Hi, colors. All right, so colors, copy, paste. All right, so I can select these guys here. Let's say I want the two text things to be grouped together. Well, there's, there's a group right there and now they will move as one. So is that what you mean? Like grouping them so that they move together? Um, when stitching out a design, it's, you would have to do it here first. So if what you're asking is, is there any way to make, um, these two colors? So as one, well, you would want to merge the colors together in design shop and send it there, or just program it as two colors where it's the same color when you set up the file. And what I mean by that is set up your colors. So when you come into, where is it here? So when you come up to set up, let's say you want the entire design to sew black, not red, black, black. Well, I would, wherever my black color would be, let's say it's needle seven, I'd say color one sews needle seven, color two sews needle seven, color three sews needle seven, and then all three will sew with a single color, regardless of what it is. Oh, John just pointed out, you think you're talking about reducing color changes versus going back and forth. Okay, so let me give an example there. Maybe that's what you're talking about. I'm sorry, I'm guessing. 
If you can clarify, I'll answer your actual question. <laughs> All right, so let's see. So let's say I've got this and I go into properties, auto borders. Let's just do it this way. All right, now I've got 13 colors, right? Just for this one letter, for this one word. It's got 12 color changes just for that. So you can't just sew one, three, five, seven, nine, and 11, and then go back in two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, unless you fix the file to do that, right? Um, you would have to rearrange it all. But I will say, if this is the type of thing you're trying to avoid, you really wanna think twice about it because um, you really want it to go one, the first letter and then the outline, the second letter and then the outline, because you wanna finish as you go. The worst thing you can, the most obnoxious thing is to sew something out. Let's say you got something that's you know 10 inches wide. You sew it all out, and then you come back to the beginning and you start outlining it. By the time you get to the end, nothing's lining up. And that's because we have push-pull, we have our fabrics are moving around, our stabilizers, our hooping might not have been perfect. You've got all those physical effects. So you're always gonna get cleaner results if you, sew, if you finish as you go. So you outline as you go. Um, and basically, even if you're doing a big design, like there was this really cool lion head that was done at an ISS show a long time ago, and it would do portions of it and do some outline work and do more portions outline work because the more you finish as you go, the better off you're gonna be. Um, so now if you really, if you know what you're doing, so if I go ahead and instead of doing this as lettering element, I'm just gonna right click, uh, operations, convert to wireframe. All right, so now it's separate colors. So if you really do want, let's say you know that what you're doing is not gonna move around and you know, I know I don't wanna finish as I go or it's not this, it's something else. And I really just want all that silver to sew first. Okay, that's cool. If I select it all like I did here, so I selected these all with my control key, left click and drag. I'm gonna put them all on the bottom. All right, so now I can put them in front of the green. So now it says all the silver and then all the green. And then right here, see that auto merge color blocks? It'll auto merge them for you. So now I just have two colors. Okay. All right, so I am using, the question that was typed in is what version of Design Shop are you using? Okay, mine just came with Alphabet, so you got the lettering. Um, so the lettering does not have any editing, so it's just lettering. So mine is the professional version, because um, I like all the features. I love decoratives. I, anyway, that's, I would cry if I had no editing or digitizing capabilities. But yeah, I'm using the top level because I decided when I got into this a long time ago, before I knew how to do anything, that my personality is, it's, if it can be done, I eventually will want to do it. So just give me all the features now and I'll figure it out. Uh, so that's, I bought the top one right out of the gate just because I'm an impatient type of person like that. So, but yeah. Um, you can use Vector. Um, yeah, the Vector format has, um, will give you some editing, right? So you can create that. And we did get you a link to the different levels. Don't cry over the software. The software is great. You should just, let's see. Yeah, I mean, you can do a whole lot of stuff with Vector. So at a bare minimum, that's what I would suggest going to is from lettering, um, because that way you can do digitizing, you can do some, uh, you can do editing. I don't believe you've got the primer stitch and whatnot, but you can still generate a whole lot of products and even create your own primer stitches just without the nifty little tools. And same with decoratives, you know, you can create them and work with them, just not all the different features. So, all right, what other questions do we have? Ah, uh, you're going to the show? Yeah, that's awesome. I'm not, I wish I was, but I'm not. It's in California, I'm in Florida. <clears throat> Next one that comes this way though, I'm going to that for sure. All right, any other questions?
And Janice, if there's questions you have, send them in and I'll try to incorporate them in our design shop. Definitely don't want you crying. So let's get you using it effectively. Yeah. You know, I have yet to go to the ISS Long Beach. Every year I'm like, I'm going to go. And then I don't. <laughs> the start of the year is really hectic. I have next week. I won't be able to be here because, um, my, oh my gosh, he's 14 now. He was, I was going to say my 13 year old, but he actually just turned 14. Um, he is, he made the all state orchestra, which is cool. Um, but it's all next week. Yeah, I'm going to go one year. But this is two years in a row that he's made All-State Orchestra. So by the time we get done with that, thinking about going to the show, it's just a lot for me. <laughs> but he's an incredibly good cello player. So it's pretty wild that he actually made it to the All-State Orchestra. Is there a trade show in Colorado? I don't know. I know there, there's big ones in Texas. There's quite a few in Florida. Um, there's some in Atlanta. Um, I know there's the ISS Long Beach. There's a lot of shows. If you look up ISS, um, that might be... Uh, do they still call it ISS? I don't even know anymore. But yay, thanks. Uh, Georgia, at some point you can always contact, reach out to your salespeople um, and see, you know, if they would be willing to make a deal at some point um, for upgrading. So, ooh, Melka just posted a link to upcoming shows. So, oh, it's Impressions Expo, not ISS anymore. Yeah, I knew about that one. And then there's the Fort Worth. That's the other one I knew about. So, this one, every year I say I'm going to go. <laughs> You still call it, John still calls it ISS as well. That's what, it, that's what it was called for years. Anyway. All right, guys. Oh, Vegas. Ah. Uh, it's all the shows I want to go to. Too many shows, not enough time. Anyway. You guys have a fantastic week. Hope everyone had a great holiday. Um, my, our family is actually still on vacation through Monday, so... I'm going to go back and see what else they've got going on. And then next week we're off to Tampa to go do Allstate Orchestra, which means my son's going to be working and I'm going to be sitting in a hotel being bored. But, you know, that's okay. <laughs> He'll be having fun. Uh, but other than that, I will. if I have connection at the hotel, I will try to do it there. Otherwise, I'll talk to Melco and see if they're going to have someone else do it or if we're just going to come back in two weeks. All right. Have a fantastic week. I hope these are helpful. Let us know what you want to learn about and we'll get them covered. All right. Bye, everyone.